Good to see you. Good to see you. So we were all hanging out, um, I don't know, it's probably a month ago now, at Flying Dog Brewery. Yes. Which was at least one of the releases of your new book, The Mind of the Censor and the Eye of the Beholder. And uh, our good friend uh, Jim Caruso actually made a beer in your honor. In Lenny Bruce's honor. In Lenny Bruce's <laughs> honor, um, called Obscenity, um, which is an unfiltered version of the truth. And it's a little bit early in the day to be drinking. I'll disappoint my great <laughs> viewers for this, but. Um, You're not going to open it? Okay. <laughs> You're not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. Um, but uh, I always ask, I like the last couple years in particular, but I feel like it's been brewing for three or four years. Uh, the new Puritanism that seems to be coming from the left. And I wonder what Lenny Bruce would think about that. <laughs> well, we, we know what those who can exercise free speech as comics have to say about it. They're increasingly staying away from college campuses. And everyone from you know Chris Rock to Jerry Seinfeld and others have said that they really stay away from college campuses because of the atmosphere there. And it is a new intolerance. Um, and you know, I, I try not to raise this in ways that politicize it and say one side is, is right and the other side is wrong. It's just the latest example of the kind of authoritarian impulse that some people have in silencing others. Yeah, and I, I've more and more I, I sort of avoid this left-right paradigm, which yes. I've never really bought into anyway. Exactly. Because, because I, I think the new rules, and maybe they were the same rules always, was this idea that you have on one side authoritarians that want that believe they passionately believe they know what you should read and how you should think. Exactly. Versus, um, I guess, libertarians or anti-authoritarians on the other side that are kind of live and let live, and, and we'll work this stuff out together. I guess that's always been the case. I, I think it has been, and that's one of the points I try and make in the book by focusing on examples of censorship through American history that come from both the left and the right. And again, uh, trying to come up with labels for one side or the other really doesn't make that much sense. It's whether you have an authoritarian impulse or not. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So tell us... Uh, um, Lay down some basic concepts, and you might get into some of the history when you do this. But the but the mind of the censor, give us give us the Viberian archetype here. Okay. Well, the the mind of the censor is that these are people who believe that uh, government authority can be used either to prohibit speech or regulate speech that think is uniquely harmful or particularly beneficial in case in the event that they want to mandate that kind of speech. Um, they are characterized by their certainty that they are correct and that other views really uh, can't be permitted. And since Anthony Comstock, and we'll get into the reasons why for that, censors in the 20th century, as First Amendment law developed, constantly try and deny that what they are doing is censorship because essentially this one example of the first really professional censor in America really spoiled the field, ruined the area for others who came after him. Yeah, so who, who was Anthony Comstock? Anthony Comstock started out as a vigilante in uh, New York City in uh, uh, the 1870s. In 1872, he came to New York after serving in the Civil War. He was a dry goods clerk, and he was a devout Puritan uh, and um, decided to uh, rid the city of sinful materials, starting with uh, smut peddlers, as he saw it. Um, he would invite members of the press to come with him on his citizen's arrest raids. Uh, and he came to the attention of the uh, gentlemen who were the benefactors to the YMCA. And they began to support him uh, and ultimately bankrolled a trip for Comstock to Washington, D.C., where he championed the uh, adoption of a new law prohibiting obscenity in the mail. Um, so he was a literal Puritan. He was yes. a, <laughs> right, he was a literal Puritan. He was someone who didn't just advocate government censorship, but he actually practiced it because one of the things that happened with the passage of this law is that he was designated as a special agent of the post office yeah. and could enforce the postal laws against the transmission of anything. And by the way, the law defined what was obscene incredibly broadly. 
and he enforced the law against everything from medical textbooks to anything involving contraceptives to, uh, in one instance, a magazine that had an article about the mating habits of marsupials. Uh, <laughs> it, it was unimaginable. And he, this applied to novels. It applied to art. It applied to a, an entire range of endeavors. Anything that he felt was impure was the subject of that. And he became and founder of a, an organization New York, in New York that was influential for the next many decades, uh, the, the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice, which <laughs> is exactly what it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. Is that law still on the books? Is what? The obscenity law? Is that the, the male law? Is that still? It is. No. Uh, now, most of it is, uh, most of the original provisions that were adopted in 1873 uh, are no longer enforceable because they're unconstitutional. But the law itself is still on the books. Is And he also was sort of the architect of of creating sort of fake grassroots hysteria to pressure politicians into believing that there's there's broad support for something that's really contrived. Well, yes and no. I mean, he was very effective in what he did. And one of the things that made him effective was his skillful use of the press and of creating campaigns. But he was also part of a larger reform movement as more people moved to cities and there was increased crime and, and other things involving vice. Uh, that was part of a larger reform movement that also included the temperance movement and anti-gambling movements and all of that. Uh, Comstock was in the forefront of that, but he would also believe that he simply owned the field and he had a particular horror of anything involving sex. Mm -hmm. And so he felt that this law gave him license and his position with the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice gave him license to essentially go after and attempt to destroy anything that he thought was sinful. Uh, and it's no surprise that among the things that happened is that he drove 15 people to suicide during the length of his career, and he would boast about that. Mm -hmm. By demonizing them and destroying them. Yes. Yeah. Well, and I think this is a theme in the book, but ironically, all of the things that he was uh, working against between gambling and sex are now very easily uh, uh, available at anyone's fingertips at this point. Well, well, that's right. I mean, if Comstock were alive today, he would be absolutely horrified. Um, the concept of gay marriage would mm -hmm. make his head explode. Uh, he would simply think that the world has been turned upside down. Yeah. Now, is that, um, this is your subtitle, The First Amendment and the Censor's Dilemma. Is that a great example of the censor's dilemma that the more they demonize um, a form of speech or content that you shouldn't have access to, the more people want it? Well, well, that's right. That's one of the many ways in which censors set themselves up for failure, and that's their dilemma. Or to use a Star Wars reference, the more you tighten your grip, the more they'll slip through your fingers. Yeah. Oh, we love Star Wars references <laughs> yes. here. So I've, I've included uh, Matt Pataglia, our executive producer, because he is, he is perhaps the world expert on comic book geekdom. <laughs> yeah. Um, and he's also a comic book artist. And, and we were talking about your book earlier, and, mm -hmm. and we really wanted to dig into the comics chapter because we're, sure. maybe we're jumping ahead a little bit in history, but that, that is sort of, uh, that's, that campaign is standing on the shoulders of, of their Comstock yeah. uh, censorship structure, right? Well, it is, and in a weird way, it's sort of like a moral panic in reverse, in that the day that, pretty much the day that the comic book panic started for real in 1948 mm -hmm. was the same day that the Supreme Court struck down a New York law that was inspired by Comstock to go after dime novels, you know, these mm -hmm. cheap novels that sensationalized cowboys and crime and, and things like that. And, and uh, this law was passed to prohibit stories of bloodshed and lust, uh, and it was struck down in 1948 in a case called Winters versus New York. Uh, and that was really the very beginning yeah. of a new campaign against comic books that tried to do the same thing. Yeah, I, dr I drink my coffee usually out of a, uh, a coffee cup that says Fred Frederick Wortham can eat a uh, eat a dick, but dick is censored. <laughs> it's a cartoonist kayfabe coffee cup. So you're self-censored. And so yeah. it's, well, it's, but that's where we've gotten to. But I, I think that um, that's interesting that it got struck down. But I was, if you could, um, so Wortham wrote his book, uh, was Seduction of the Innocent. Yes, in 1954. And the, the thing that I think is interesting about it is that comics – 
sort of comics, um, you know, the the various publishers and everyone ended up self-censoring because of it is what happened because it yes. wasn't a legal thing, correct? Well, it was not a legal thing, but it was as a result of legal pressure. Mm -hmm. And it was an example of an industry just not being able to take the pressure anymore because they thought what was coming was worse. Uh, the precedent for that was in the film industry when the production code was adopted mm -hmm. um, in Hollywood. And that was done because there was threat of state by state uh, censorship of movies. And in fact, at the time, it was constitutional for states each have their own censorship boards for whether or not movies could be distributed in their, uh, in their communities. And so Hollywood's reaction was to self-regulate, and they adopted the production code, which imposed very strict regulations. And the comic code that came out of the uh, Senate hearings in mm -hmm. the 50s um, was really a replication of what had happened with, with film. And the upshot was that the number of titles for comic books for the first time in a decade started to decline. Mm -hmm hundreds if not thousands of artists and writers uh, were uh, fired, they lost their jobs, yep. and comics became very bland mm -hmm. for about 10 or 15 years when things started changing um, uh, with underground comics. And uh, You uh, mentioned and so Zap in your, yes. in your book, um, which I think it's funny because Crumb sort of with Zap and, and all of his work was very, the, the underground was very subversive then. And yes. Crumb's arc went from subversive to being, you know, uh, the the artist, the the Bears or the Grateful the Grateful Dead, he, you know, to being a major. They have a documentary about Crumb, and then now he's he's subversive again because he's been sort of canceled out by culture again because he's <laughs> his his art is so, sort of has upset the um, the current censors, I guess. Yeah, there's always going to be something that upsets somebody. Yes. <laughs> um, so I was wondering with again with. With that law that you mentioned about the dime store novels, I've never heard about that. Is that no no one else saw this case as any sort of precedent setting? Or? Well, well, they did, as a matter of fact, and that's why um, this was sort of the the normal story arc of a moral panic was sort of flipped on its head. If you look at what happened with Comstock when he was going after well, everything, mm -hmm. um, that really began the movement toward the first movement toward a First Amendment bar. Uh, lawyers had been honing arguments trying to put some teeth into the First Amendment beginning in the 1870s when, um, uh, you know, when Comstock was first operating. But First Amendment doctrine and First Amendment law didn't really develop into well into the 20th century. It was the 30s, really, before courts started, and the Supreme Court started upholding First Amendment rights. And yet they were finally reacting to and implementing and accepting the arguments that had been made by lawyers for decades. Mm -hmm. But it was a resistance to Comstock that led to those arguments being made and eventually being successful. And they were in 1948 when the Supreme Court struck down this New York law about uh, you know amassing stories of bloodshed and lust. And what's weird about it is that the legal punchline came at the mm -hmm. beginning of this moral panic, right? right? The, the law was set at the beginning and the reaction and the campaigns of Wordham and others and of you know, senators who held hearings on, on juvenile delinquency in comics was sort of a way to try and push back and get around the baseline protection that the Supreme Court had set. Mm -hmm. And so as this was happening, the law continued to develop. More First Amendment protections were recognized by the court and yet the pressure of the possibility of legislation continued. Hmm. I'll ask this to both of you because I, I seem to recall that around the same time, um, the military industrial complex and the government started financing war propaganda through comics. Is that correct? The, and, and how does that play into this? That would have been almost, con that would have been con probably before. It, it would have been started, before. and it, Because it most was, of those guys went off into World War II. That's right. Well, and this was at, at a time when comics were at the height of their popularity. Yeah. Uh, beginning in the early 30s and then into the 40s, um, you had this development of comics, and it was a flourishing publishing industry, very popular among many adults, very mm -hmm. popular among troops. Um, and it was sort of a reaction to that growing popularity that led Wordham and others to begin to push back. Actually, some of the first people who were um, uh, active in, even before Wordham, uh, were um, 
uh, members of the Catholic Church mm -hmm. who would describe Superman as a fascist yeah. and, and so on. And, and uh, so that sort of fed into the post-war uh, reactions to comic books and ultimately the comic book code. Well, and the, 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 the ramifications of it was it infant, infantilized the, the entire medium. It for, did. And, it, and it's taken probably until the last maybe 30 years, I'd say. Probably the a mid, little more, yeah. I mean, mid, it, mid '80s is it, when it started to turn yeah. around. In the '80s is when graphic novels really took off, and you had things like The Dark Knight come yeah. along and blaze a trail, and then that led to a whole new uh, cultural re renaissance as comic art and uh, comic book forms of storytelling uh, really taking over in many ways uh, what what goes on in Hollywood. Because and their they, what happened, I think, when with with all the pressure, was it it allowed actually like. A, companies like Marvel and DC to consolidate their hold on the industry because they were the only ones equipped to start making books that sort of fit. EC Comics ceased to exist because everything they made fell under the rules of the, the comics code. It did. Well, they were, the, they were a primary target of the comic book code. And, and they, they were had, the biggest publisher at the time. They were, and they published um, horror comics and uh, com yeah. uh, comics about crime and so on. And the one sort of plus side to all of that uh, is that William Gaines, mm -hmm. who had been the publisher of EC Comics, got out of the business uh, after the 1954 hearings and founded Mad Magazine. Yeah. Hmm. And then went and did subversive things there. <laughs> exactly. Well, I'm curious. Like, I, I hear about the consolidation of incumbents, and I, I don't know this history, but I'm wondering if um, there is a version of bootleggers and Baptists when it comes to censorship. And of course, bootleggers and Baptists is sort of the classic public choice story where Puritans are joined forces with um, incumbent interests to um, both succeed, but with different goals. Like the, the, the bootleggers wanted to stop liquor and no, I said that backwards. So, so the bootleggers wanted to kill legal liquor, and the Baptists didn't want anyone to drink. So, by prohibiting alcohol, um, the the Baptists didn't really win, but the bootleggers won big time. <laughs> so, is is there those those unholy alliances in censorship? I don't know that they're really alliances so much as uh, you know. It sounds you make it sound more organized than I think. Yeah, and it it, is. maybe it's not organized at all. It's a confluence of interests. True. Yeah. And, yeah. and you get that in, in censorship? In a way, although, you know, if you go back to Comstock, he saw no value of anything that he wanted to censor, and it wasn't his aim to make it more popular. As a matter of fact, he um, really uh, never really got the joke that what he opposed made it more popular. So when uh, George Bernard Shaw was opening the play Mrs. Warren's Profession on Broadway, um, Comstock sent a threatening letter to the uh, theater's owner saying that he thought that the play shouldn't go on. The theater owner, not being an idiot, knew that he could um, you know, cash in on the publicity. And so he leaked the story and publicly invited Comstock to come and uh, sit in on a rehearsal, yeah. uh, which Comstock, of course, indignantly refused. Um, but it made the play so popular that on opening night, uh, the New York police had to call out the reserves to manage the crowds. So the notion that it was publicly known that Comstock would oppose it uh, made it uh, all the more alluring, all the more popular. Actually, there was another example, and this is something that Comstock himself wrote about in an 1888 essay called uh, Vampire Literature, where he tells the sad story of a fashionably dressed young woman that came to his office and said she was an actress, but she'd written a novel. And her publisher said it might be a little too racy and thought she should check with Comstock first. So she was doing that. And when he told her that it absolutely could not be published, she asked him if he would please attack it just a little <laughs> so, that, <laughs> so, so that it would get some attention. Yeah. yeah. So, so like the, the new version of, of social media mobs, maybe. So yeah. I realized that we jumped ahead and, and I wanted to get you to tell a little bit, little bit about your personal story because you're sort of the original gangster of, of <laughs> defending free speech. Um, give us give us a little bit of your history and resume and some of the some of the big cases you've worked on. Well, um, 
Let's see. Let me, let me start with the thing that uh, brought us both to uh, Flying Dog Brewery uh, in November, and that was in 2003, I teamed up with uh, Ron Collins and David Scover, who had written the book, The Trials of Lenny Bruce, and we filed uh, a request with Governor Pataki of New York for a posthumous pardon for Lenny Bruce. Uh, people have actually heard of Lenny now. I mean, it, it's funny, he's gaining a new cultural uh, significance because of shows like The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel and so on. But uh, for younger people, many have not heard of him. But he was a path-breaking comic in the 50s and 60s uh, who was arrested multiple times in various cities around the country for obscenity, including New York City, if you can believe that. Uh, that conviction from 1964 was still on the books. And so in 2003, we, we sought uh, the posthumous pardon from Governor, uh, Governor Pataki. And miraculously... Uh, he granted it, uh, and so uh, sort of removing that blot on the First Amendment in, in New York State history. For something like that, is that is that like a personal decision he makes, or is what are the politics of getting Governor Pataki to do something well, like I, that? I can't speak to politics. I don't know anything <laughs> about, about politics. And you're, I, you're a wise man. I, I can't imagine, you know, any reason for a governor to that to do that other than the fact that it was the right thing. Yeah. I mean, it's not like there are a lot of uh, constituents from the graveyard that are going right. to come vote for him, uh, yeah. although I'm forgetting my Chicago history here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, but his proclamation said that this was a an endorsement by the state uh, of uh, um, the importance of the First Amendment. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that was that was one of the things. That not a case really, but yeah, uh, yeah. it's it's something that uh, I got involved with a number of years ago, and I'm very proud of. Uh, very uh, uh, honored to have a connection in some way to uh, Lenny Bruce. Um, I uh, argued the case United States versus Playboy Entertainment Group in the Supreme Court, and uh, that. Uh, uh, succeeded in having struck down a section of the Telecommunications Act of 1996 that targeted adult cable networks. Um, I defended uh, CBS uh, network in the Super Bowl uh, wardrobe malfunction case, yeah. the <laughs> Janet Jackson, Justin Timberlake fiasco, uh, and, and a number of other cases. I've done a bunch of cases uh, with uh, FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education, in defending free speech on college campuses as well. Yeah, and I, I want to maybe get to, to campus speech at some point. The one, one of you, I heard you tell the the, the Janet Jackson nipple slip story. <laughs> Formative moment of my youth. <laughs> and it was, I mean, it was another example of sort of a contrived moral panic that was pure astroturf. Um, tell, tell that because <laughs> it, it's it interesting. Was. <laughs> well, and the thing is, you have to understand this in the context of the unique area of FCC and decency regulation. And full disclosure, I used to be uh, an FCC official. Uh, oh, I no. was, for a time, was chief counsel to uh, Chairman James Quello at the FCC. I spent four years uh, working on the staff. Um, was that around the time when Eminem rapped the FCC won't let me be? Uh, it was before that, actually. Okay. How'd they this feel was... when you started, you went and defended Playboy? And, uh... Well, I've, I've joked with people that uh, I used to work at the FCC, and now I prefer to think of them as the defendant. But uh, <laughs> uh, it's not literally true because the FCC was going after uh, yeah. networks and so on. But mm-hmm. nonetheless, it's a good line. Um, but one of the reasons I, I – well, it wasn't so much an evolution because I had had a long interest in First Amendment before my time at the FCC, and in fact practiced First Amendment law, uh, private practice, and then went to the FCC and learned more about how the agency works. And one of the things that I worked on while I was there was uh, the indecency cases. Now, one of the things about being a staff member for a government agency is that you're not there to propagate your own views. You represent your client, and your client is the government agency, or in this case, my commissioner. Mm -hmm. And so, my job was to inform him on the law, and he would then vote the way he was he was going to vote. And yet I had my own personal feelings about uh, that area of the law. I thought that it wasn't really a, a legitimate uh, doctrine, that it was one that was contrived and um, essentially uninterpretable, unenforceable. And what I tried to do while I was there was, at least within 
my purview, bring some sense of what the rule of law would look like <laughs> if you applied it to indecency. And it, it's hard in that area because so many of the decisions of the FCC are unpublished letter rulings that go out to individual stations. They're never published. People don't know them, and, and they don't know if you know what the FCC has considered to be indecent or okay on one occasion is on another. And so what I started doing in my office was collecting these letter rulings, and when I go to meetings of other advisors to commissioners, and we'd have meetings to decide whether or not you know, what the FCC should do about a given complaint, I would try and say, well, in these cases, we said it was okay. Now, I didn't imagine that at the time that would lead people to say, oh my God, we're, we're forming precedent here. <laughs> you know, Because largely what happens is that these decisions are politically driven. What causes a scandal causes Congress to lean on the FCC. The FCC doesn't have really set standards here. And so having a notion that this was going to be accountable in some sort of legal analysis was not acceptable. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, I, you know, I actually, I, I can tell this story. When, when there was a complaint against a Mount Vernon, Illinois radio station for broadcasting the song, Who Are You? by The Who, mm -hmm. which, I mean, I, I'd heard the song a million times and it I'd never really clicked with me that Roger Daltrey, uh, Daltrey at one point sings, Who the Fuck Are You? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know why I didn't hear it. It's sort of background noise, you know? Um, but anyway, the complaint comes in, and we're sitting around a table with, uh, uh, the, or I'm sitting around a table with the other advisors to commissioners, and I'm trying to say, well, you know, here are a number of letter rulings that uh, say that a fleeting statement like this is okay, and um, people were sort of like, saying, okay, this is the rule of law thing again. Uh, that was making no headway with that. And I said, look, this is a song that's played by classic rock stations a thousand times every day. Mm -hmm. And if we take action on this complaint, we're going to look like idiots. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, everyone around the table stopped and thought, oh, that's not really a good look, is it? <laughs> and so they... <laughs> They put that complaint in a drawer and let yeah. it sit for years. Mm -hmm. And it was actually sometime after I left the FCC that um, that complaint was dismissed um, basically by saying it was unintelligible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, 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 it gets to like I've, I've, I've come to the frustrating realization, well, it's just the way it is, that um, – People in government who aren't supposed <coughs> to consider politics and public opinion mm -hmm. always do. And and whether or not your actions make you look good or bad at this in this case in the FCC, that's an interesting <laughs> thing because the who's who's bigger than they are. Well, Congress for one. Yeah. No, I said the who. <laughs> the who. <laughs> oh, oh, right. Oh, I'm sorry. The band is <laughs> exactly ha, the band has more PR juice than well, they that, do. Well that yeah. that's a good point. Well and also at that time I mean, like you said, like I've heard that song thousands of times on radio, and you never think about it. Yeah. It's just... Yeah. Although what happened later on in the, what the um, moral panic that I describe in the book mm -hmm. is that those kinds of inadvertent or fleeting or very brief references came to be the focus mm -hmm. of a campaign and got Congress's attention, yeah. and it led to... Well, the wardrobe malfunction case mm -hmm. and cases involving live award shows that led both the FCC and Congress to way overreact and to do it in ways that finally got them in front of courts. And the courts were going to put up with this standardless nonsense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is kind of a nice segue to the PMRC. Yes. And uh, this, uh, my, my personal history is I, I watched that case with obsession um, but this was what, late 80s, I believe? It was 1985, September 1985, the Parents Music Resource Center. And I started watching because I was a huge Frank Zappa fan. Yes. And by my first, I believe my first article I ever wrote for Reason Magazine was a review of Frank Zappa's autobiography, which very much circles around the parent, Parents Music Resource Center. Yes. Um, were you personally involved with that, or is... I was not. I mean, I was working as an associate in another law firm in D.C. at the time. I was very interested in the area and was uh, writing some articles in, in that and related topics. Yeah. Um, but I watched the hearings on C-SPAN uh, at the time and kept files on that and then didn't really get around to uh, 
writing more about it until I had the chapter in the book that focuses on that episode. Yeah. I, I'm going to ask you to sort of remind people what it was, but just an editorial comment. It was it was fun watching Zappa and D. Snyder just, just hand the heads <laughs> back to these um, very haughty senators yes. all the time telling them this is not censorship. Yes. Well, and don't forget John Denver and, yeah. and John Denver as the, the poster boy that all of the members of the Senate panel loved and fawned over, nonetheless said, look, this is censorship. And uh, uh, the one thing that they wanted to avoid was anyone calling them out yeah. on it being censorship, saying that this was just a voluntary thing. Yeah. But it's voluntary with the government's thumb on the scale, both with a carrot and a stick. There was the stick in terms of threats that there could be legislation and the threats that they could use FCC action to enforce what could be played on the radio. And a stick, or I mean a carrot, in the form of promised legislation for the music industry in the form of a blank tape tax that would have given a share of profits from the sale of blank tapes to recorded music interests um, because they were worried about people copying um, uh, records and tapes. But this was a um, this was a moral panic started, I guess, by Tipper Gore, and maybe um, Mrs. Baker. Tip, for, yeah, yeah. T- Tipper Gore, Susan Baker. There were a number of prominent Hollywood. I mean, Hollywood. Holly- <laughs> Political. Funny. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, Washington wives. Yeah. That uh, decided to form this organization called PMRC. It, it really didn't have that many members, mm-hmm. but the Los Angeles Times estimated that half of PMRC's membership was married to 10% of the Senate. Yeah. And so that <laughs> explains why, when they took up an issue, that the Parents Television, t- Parents, uh, Parent Teachers Association, the PTA, uh, had been trying to get. Uh, prominently uh, discussed for a couple of years, uh, and we're making no headway. Once the Washington wives of PMRC got involved, within a couple of months, they got this hearing before the Senate Commerce Committee in September 1985. Uh, They got the attention of uh, regulators and legislators, and a lot more pressure was then put on the music industry. So one of my theories that I've I haven't researched to know whether or not it's true, but I suspect it was definitely a, a part of this, is Al Gore ends up running for president in 88. Yes. And this was, um, I suppose this precedes uh, Bill Clinton's sister soldier moment. <laughs> but I suspect that he was trying to establish his sort of uh, uh, family values <clears throat> bona fides through his wife, Tipper Gore, going into his his aspirations to be president is that is that fair or is that just speculative you know i try not to psychoanalyze uh, politicians i mean it's certainly plausible it certainly would work with the narrative of of i think most ambitious politicians and you know uh, as someone who uh, was uh, giving me some advice when i went to the fcc uh they told me look there's no political downside to going after indecency or anything to protect the children because after all Mm. uh, you know it's going to be a very popular message and if you go too far the courts will take care of it Uh, that's the theory anyway Um, and so it's always sort of a very popular political move as I described in various episodes in the book involving comics and music and, and, and so on But it's also true that uh, because of Comstock and because in the 20th century we developed both a culture of free expression in America as well as a solid core of legal protections for uh, the First Amendment is that censorship is seen as a bad thing, the censor's dilemma that I talked about before. And it's why the senators of the Senate Commerce Committee went to great pains to try and say what they were doing in that hearing had nothing to do with censorship. Yeah. Uh, Frank Zappa actually made a song about this where he loops some of the more absurd things that Ernest <laughs> Hollings and others had to say about it. But I, um, it would be interesting to count, and maybe you have, how many times they said this is not censorship. Well, I did count that, and it, it worked out to be pretty much once every five minutes. Yeah. Uh, and mm-hmm. and uh, it's, uh, it was a repeated refrain throughout the hearing. Don't call us censors. We're not censors. And the thing that made the senators the angriest is when Frank Zappa uh, delivered, I think, the best line of the hearing, 
when he called the PMRC proposal a recipe for censorship whipped up like an instant pudding by the wives of Big Brother. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um. I, I have a FCC question. So I, rec I watched the um, South Park documentary Six Days Till Air, which was just it was about how they make an episode. And towards the end of the episode um, of the documentary, they're talking about sending the scripts over to the FCC. <laughs> and how, you know, when they started they were way they couldn't get away with as much and you know at the, whenever this documentary came out was it was filmed when the book of mormon came out and so that at this point they, but it's just it seems like it, it's it's completely random as to what gets by what doesn't and well i, I haven't seen that documentary so i can't speak to it that was that was their comments in the documentary there it's like sometimes this sometimes they can get away with this much sometimes they can get away yeah. with this much and but uh, to be clear, no one sends their scripts to the FCC. Okay. Uh, the FCC as a government agency, uh, that would be or an example, a classic example of a prior restraint, it whether they approved it or not. It, probably they sent it okay. to the network lawyers who would then try and guess what was in the FCC's mind. And it gets even more complicated because South Park is a cable network. Mm -hmm. It's not a broadcast network. And the law applies differently to cable than it does to broadcast, although basic cable channels through more tradition and history, have tried to adhere, at least until recent years, mm -hmm. more to what were perceived as broadcast standards. Um, the um, well, it's a funny question. They should say they were being reviewed by the FCC. I, I mean, I don't know. Again, my memory isn't yeah. great, uh, but I they you know they mentioned how like there are certain things that they can get away with and certain things they yeah. can't, and it's sort of like a it's 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 all it's the same with like the MPAA where. You know, you can get away with one fuck in a PG-13 movie, but if it's two, you're now R. But again, that's a private rating system. Right. And that is not an example of illegal censorship. And um, you can argue about the merits or demerits uh, of different rating systems. Uh, there's a lot to be said for an industry wanting to at least give people a guide, a rough guide, mm -hmm. of what to expect when they go to a movie. Some people say the, uh, the the rating system is highly successful at that. Other people disagree with that. But again, it's it's an area where you can have an honest debate. But it's still not an example of unconstitutional censorship. Mm -hmm. And the FCC has, in sort of a <clears throat> oh uh, wink a winking way, tried to avoid that. And mm -hmm. this came up in in the '80s when the FCC was trying to tweak its rules for indecency. And a very smart lawyer named John Krigler, who represented Pacifica Radio, uh, decided to send a request for a declaratory ruling for whether or not Pacifica could do a radio reading of uh, a section of Ulysses for its annual Bloomsday uh, celebration. And, um, you know, this is the James Joyce classic from the 30s that had been censored as a book and then later, uh, as First Amendment law developed, uh, was allowed to be published in the United States. And the question was whether or not you could do this classic bit of literature on the radio. What Krigler did not do is tell the FCC that the language he sent came from Ulysses. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so he said, would it be okay if we broadcast this passage? Yeah. And someone, uh, it turned out, uh, when that went to the FCC, had read a book <laughs> and realized, oh, this is Ulysses, and that it would really look bad for the FCC to um, uh, be prejudging whether or not you could do a reading. And so they punted, and they basically said, asking us to rule on a program in advance is a prior restraint, which is defined as censorship. We cannot do that. You got to take your chances. Yeah. So I guess, I so, so back to the, P, the PM, RC. PMRC, <coughs> mm -hmm. um, so that that goes to court and that censorship, but then we we have all these examples of sort of <clears throat> we'll call it privately adopted rating systems. Yes, which in some ways I think can have similar effects as the censors, where you're you're with the comics code, you due to the adoption of the comics code, you destroy you put a number of publishers that completely out of business because they simply couldn't compete by uh, all of their stories were outside of the range of it, um, including romance stories, which was also, you know, Jack Kirby had started by drawing romance stories. Yes. So that was always, but, um, you know, where's this, this, I guess I'm curious where the line is as far as these sort of, um, you know, we can call them privately adopted, but they're generally adopted under the, the, 
the stick is being the stick is also there. So they are. Well, it, it, the movie rating system is a really interesting and complicated story because it has a uh, a rich history behind it. Mm-hmm. When the production code first went into um, uh, came into existence in the late twenties. Um, Though all of those pre-code movies had been had gotten increasingly racy and so on, and they were increasingly popular for audiences, and suddenly you had sort of a centralized authority in Hollywood who was going to review scripts and review scenes and and make uh, uh, judgments. Um, but it was at a time before First Amendment protection was recognized at all for mm-hmm. cinema. The prevailing law at the time was that this is an area that is simply not protected by the First Amendment. When you move forward to the 1960s, and particularly the mid-1960s, by then, the Supreme Court had decided that cinema was protected by the First Amendment, and it had been for about 20 years, but it also struck down these state licensing boards that had been the pressure that applied on on Hollywood in the 20s that led them to adopt the production code. So when the Motion Picture Association adopted it, what is now its current rating system in the late 1960s. It was in an atmosphere in which there were much more robust protections for uh, free speech and the freedom of cinema, and at a time when there were great cultural changes. And so while you can say that it was like the production code, in a way it was freeing people up from the strictures of the production code, Mm -hmm. much more decentralized, and also allowing people to have those ratings without the threat of government regulation. So again, the interplay between private systems and government pressure is really complicated and Mm context-specific. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, I'm thinking that, I'm thinking of to fast forward to the problems we're dealing with today. There's this ongoing argument, and I don't know exactly what to think of it myself, um, as to what's what's illegal government censorship, particularly in, in the context of social media. We were talking about YouTube before we went live. Yes. Um, and, and going back to the PMRC model, I believe that uh, voluntary regulation emerged from that, that effort, which sort of comically became a badge of honor for for certain hip hop groups to it get did. to get the sticker. Well, not just mm-hmm. hip hop groups. Yeah. I mean, George Carlin has an album uh, that just says explicit lyrics, and it shows his eyes peering over the <laughs> yeah. uh, the music uh, label that the PMRC had had championed. Um, and that's been sort of the history of each of the episodes of censorship that I, that I talk about, both the legal failure of the restrictions, but also the so- social and cultural failure of the restrictions, and in fact, the complete reversal of uh, what the censors had tried to do. I I guess my, the the thing that I I see now though, is that I guess it seems that there's less of, the onus of censorship isn't necessarily pushed through government anymore, so much as it is done through the either, you know, ratings boards or through the people who control the publishers or, you know, the, the production, uh, it seems like that's where the censorship happens. And that's not as much of a legal question as I guess the, your, your point. Well, there's oh, fact, there's fact checkers too. Like there's right. a, there's a fact checker industrial complex and I can't, <laughs> I can't figure out if it's private or public or both or what's going on. Uh, well, that's <laughs> not a 10 words or less answer that you yeah, can give sure, to that yeah. question. I mean, there, there's a lot going on for one thing. There's still plenty of government censorship, mm-hmm. and, and you can find that. And sometimes it'll be exerted through formal measures as in a law that gets adopted to try and, and restrict what either platforms or uh, publishers can do, mm-hmm. uh, or through uh, informal pressures. Uh, I was involved in a case about five or six years ago involving Backpage.com, mm-hmm. where the sheriff of Cook County, Illinois, sent letters to the credit card companies basically saying, you're going to stop doing business. Uh, or as a concerned father and citizen, I think you should stop doing business yeah. with this yeah. entity. Uh, and um, by the way, I'm having a press conference tomorrow, and mm-hmm. I'll be naming anyone who's still doing business with them. Um, we had that uh, uh, effort to uh, pressure uh, the credit card companies, declared unconstitutional, and in a 
uh, really funny opinion uh, from the Seventh Circuit by Judge Posner uh, describing uh, how unconstitutional that kind of thing is. And it, it harkens back to efforts that were done in the 60s to go after comic books and novels mm -hmm. and things like that. So I see uh, uh, we're running out of time, but we have to talk about Dave Chappelle. And you've, <laughs> you've worn your Dave Chappelle shirt. And this, I have. this, this is this is kind of related to this. Um, and we've all seen, and, and I, I know you, you mentioned it, but we've all seen The, the Closer, um, which was yes. Chappelle's last special, uh, super controversial. And, and I, what, what happens in a world where Dave Chappelle isn't nearly as powerful as Dave Chappelle is, and Netflix decides to pull it down because of this contrived grassroots pressure on Twitter? Well, we've always had to depend on the courage and fortitude of publishers and disseminators of information. That was true in the first half of the 20th century when it was only a few bold publishers that would publish novels like Ulysses and mm -hmm. try and get them into the United States. Uh, it was true with uh, the emergence of movies and, and cinema, uh, you know, independent cinema houses that would air uh, or, or uh, promote movies that were controversial at the time. And it's true of, of platforms as well today. Um, as, uh, you know, uh, certain politicians have found, uh, they don't have a right to publish their book with any publisher. The mm -hmm. publisher has to decide whether to publish it or not. No one has a right to have their book in a given bookstore. Uh, those are uh, decisions that are made by independent uh, entities that have their own First Amendment rights to decide what they're going to carry or not. The same is true with social media platforms. Uh, they have the right to determine what kind of community they want to foster or what their terms of service are going to be. Whether or not you think their policies are wise is a separate question, mm -hmm. um, but it, it's one they'll have to make for themselves. And if you think that that's an area where the government should step in with some sort of regulation, like a fairness doctrine for the Internet, or declaring uh, social media platforms to be common carriers, right. then you haven't studied the history of communications law and you haven't seen how s those kinds of proposals, no matter how well-intentioned, always fail. Yeah. No, I, I mean, uh, I think we would always agree No one in this room wants the government to do that. The, the, <laughs> the, the government can't fix it, but I, but I wonder if we could get to a point where they're even less involved because I still remember the hearing where um, I guess it was a Senate, but I don't remember. Mark Zuckerberg is hauled before Congress, and he's being berated for this and that, and like both sides are mad at him because he didn't do what they wanted him to do. And his response ultimately was, well, let's sit down and write the speech code. He didn't use that phrase, but let's, let's write the regulations together as to how we censor Facebook and other social media platforms so I worry that just by bullying incumbents and, 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 and forcing them to the table, which they do have the power to do, um, the natural inclination is, well, let's write the regulations in a way that help me and stop the next wannabe Facebook from entering the market. Well, I can't speak to um, Mark Zuckerberg's uh, testimony, but I can look at politically what's going on now with various, quote, reform efforts to um, uh, sort of right the balance on Internet regulation. And the focal point for that has always ended up on Section 230 yeah. of the, uh, the Telecommunications Act. We could do a whole new show on, on that. But what I will say is that if you look at the various proposals, what you see is a complete reversal of the political order. Um, so, so, for example, if you remember the debates over network neutrality, a, which was always a regulatory solution in search of a problem, you had people on the left saying, you can't have those big companies deciding what is legal to, to uh, transmit over the Internet. We're simply not going to allow that kind of control. And then you had people on the right saying, no, we need free speech on the Internet. Let the um, um, Internet players decide. And now you look at Section 230 reform proposals, and there are about two dozen of them or more pending in Congress right now. And they're divided evenly down the middle between liberals and conservatives. And you can take the positions that had formerly, formerly been advocated for network neutrality and simply reverse them. 
you have uh, the uh, progressives and liberals saying, oh no, we want these platforms to do more policing of content. We want them to police what is true, and we want them to police whether or not something is hate speech, and we want them to police these various things. And then you have um, um, conservatives saying, oh no, we should make sure that the platforms can't have any role in this. We, we now need to make them common carriers. So yeah. it's, it's really um, uh, sort of mind-blowing. Yeah, it's, it, it's probably back to that original dividing line between authoritarians and not authoritarians, and it's not, it's not a left or right thing. It's, it's whether or not you think that you just want to control the levers of power to do it your way. Right, and that ultimately is the point that I try and make in the book by showing that the examples of censorship through our history mm -hmm. have come both from the right, they've come from the left, but the characteristics that they share are described in what I call the Comstock playbook and then uh, the, the Foxworthy uh, yeah. rule. One, well, even just, I mean, reading your the comics chapter, it seems like the arc of all, a lot of these historical cases, right? The comics code doesn't exist anymore. Right. Um, it's a far more open place than it's ever been. I, there, there are, if you want to publish your story, it doesn't matter what you put in it, you can find a place to publish it and you can get eyeballs on it. Um, is that what the arc is that a sort of a pretty general arc for most of these ca historical cases where it swings it, back the other way? It, well, it is, and it's because of the two trends the trend in terms of legal protections for speech that through the 20th century has continued to grow so that now we're facing sort of a, back, a backlash among some saying that uh, the First Amendment and the courts have gone too far in protecting speech. Uh, and the other thing is the cultural atmosphere, mm. that uh, there is a culture of free speech. Now, not everybody is going to agree, for political reasons, on which speech should be protected and which speech um, should be restricted. But the idea that speech should be protected, generally my speech, not yours, yeah. is something yeah. that people tend <laughs> yeah. to accept. So I, I want to end on a positive note and, and hopefully make the the moral case for free speech and I'm thinking specifically of the of the Chappelle episode I know you're a fan because I heard you talk about it somewhere else but it strikes me that this this inclination on college campuses to so censor comics that they won't go is a problem for people that would love to see a little bit of uh, understanding across the tribes and, and, the, and the categories that we've all been siloed in. And comics are allowed to say things that the rest of us aren't allowed to say, at least they used to be. Yeah. And, and what I got out of that Chappelle episode was empathy and understanding across these, these supposedly moral and, and political dividing lines. If we stop comics, going back to Lenny Bruce, if we stop comics from serving their function in society, how do we figure out people that are different from us? And that, well, that's, that's why right. I like free speech. Yeah, I mean, that that's, puts it very succinctly. I think that states it well. And I think, in particular, uh, comics, and those comics that have engaged in social commentary, beginning with Lenny Bruce, uh, go, uh, going through that with with uh, George Carlin, and now with uh, Dave Chappelle, and you know, obviously others, um, you know, people who are focusing only on what offends them aren't listening to the message. They aren't listening to the fact that these people are trying to say something. And particularly with the example lately of Dave Chappelle and The Closer, it, it, the only way you can really be offended at, at that is if you don't listen to what he's really trying to say. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well said. Uh, let's, let's end it there. And this has been fascinating. And mm -hmm. Let's uh, let's argue about two thirty sometime because I, I don't actually <laughs> want to argue about it, but I need <laughs> exactly. better ammunition. Okay, <laughs> happy that to. Confusing. Thank you. Oh, um, um, I should have asked you, but like, besides, you want people to check out your book. Yes, and it's called "The Mind of the Censor and the Eye of the Beholder: The First Amendment and the Censor's Dilemma." Available wherever books are sold. Wherever books are sold, and including these these massive censorous monoliths. Um, <laughs> exactly. Is there any place else you want to want people to check out? Uh, well, um, I, I have a website, uh, mindofthecensor.com. Uh, you probably won't see anything there that you haven't heard on this show uh, now. Um, and um, that will give you, I think, uh, as much information as you need. Cool. This has been great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.
That was amazing. Where can I get more content just like that? That's a great question. You're clearly a discerning consumer of the best content. Make sure to like the video, subscribe, and click the bell. And if you're consuming podcasts, go to Apple, Stitcher, anywhere you get them. I'm in. Kibbe on Liberty, honest conversations with interesting people. Mm -hmm.